welcome to this Build It webinar on Eco Homes Building a Sustainable Timber Home, which is kindly sponsored by the Structural Timber Association. I'm Chris Bates, editor of Build It magazine, and I'll be joined for this session by two of the UK's leading timber building experts. Hundreds of you have registered for this live webinar, and I can see a lot of you are here now already logged in. Uh, we've got a lot of content to get through, so we'll get started now. Um, before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, questions will be answered at the end, so please do submit them via the Q&A button uh, below at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can upvote questions you like by clicking on the thumbs up, and that means there's probably a better chance of it getting answered. Uh, and for any technical feedback, please use the chat function and a, a Build It team member will be there to try and help you. And finally, if you can't see the slides properly at the moment, you may need to select the fit to window option in your Zoom settings. So our agenda for today, uh, first off, we'll introduce our uh, STA experts, and then we'll get on to talking about eco home design and going fabric first, uh, a key principle of sustainable eco building. After that, we'll consider how timber systems in particular can be an ideal fit for an eco home build before moving on to a detailed look at some example timber walling systems, including timber frame, structural insulated panels and encapsulated oak with a couple of case studies of real live projects. We'll then be taking your questions live to help you get the specific advice you need to move your own project forward. So I'm delighted to welcome two uh, expert STA panelists for our Build It webinar. Uh, Simon Orles is Managing Director of Frame Technologies and has over 20 years experience in self-built timber construction and is a regular member of our build systems debate at the Build It Live show, so he likes a challenge. Uh, welcome, Simon. Uh, Paul Duffin is National Sales Manager at Kingspan Timber Solutions and Potton, and has a wealth of technical knowledge to share. He's also currently in the middle of his first self-build, so thanks, Paul, for taking time out to be with us today. Hello, Paul. Hi, Al. Simon. Simon. Sorry, there I'm here. <laughs> Uh, today's webinar, as I said, is sponsored by the Structural Timber Association. Uh, the STA is the UK's largest trade association within the structural timber sector, and its mission is to enhance quality and drive product innovation through technical guidance and research. And that's underpinned by an independent member's quality standard assessment, the STA Assure, which is recognised by the leading structural warranty and building control bodies in the self-build sector. Now, if you're just starting out on your eco home building journey, one phrase you're likely to encounter sooner rather than later is fabric first. And fundamentally, this is all about focusing your energy saving measures on the fabric of the building. By that, we mean the design and the components that make up the main superstructure and create the thermal envelope, the structural shell. Uh, if that envelope performs well, then you'll need less energy to heat and cool your new home. So you can opt for smaller, lower carbon heating systems, for instance. So let's take a quick look at some of the key principles of a fabric first approach. Um, so space heating actually accounts for, on, in a typical home for about 60% of energy usage. So with fabric first, you're looking to reduce heat loss by prioritizing the performance of the house shell, the thermal envelope. Uh, and the main components of that house shell are going to be obviously the structural components like the bricks and box or timber frame, uh, insulation, air tightness barriers, and uh, looking as well at things like thermal bridging, which is how uh, where heat can escape across building components. So you're trying to block that with more insulation. Uh, another key element of the superstructure is glazing. Uh, we tend to have a lot of windows and doors in our homes these days, so they need to be of a good high performance. Uh, design wise, people often look at passive solar design where you can uh, strategically position glazing um, to gain free heat, uh, and reduce the amount of heat you need to generate. Um, but you do need to avoid overheating with that. So looking at sh solar shading measures such as Brie Soleil uh, or uh, ways to sort of accommodate the extra heat building in thermal mass, for example. Um, and then there are eco design standards and probably the best known of those is Passive House. And Simon, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking a quick question, the, the focus on achieving with Passive House is sort of on achieving strict performance limits for U values, air tightness, uh, using triple glazing. Do you think self-builders should always aim for this kind of gold standard? 
Yeah, like but, uh, obviously a passive house is a premium level to achieve, but also as a lot of people these days are working to passive house principles and obviously that is that is not to be forgotten and obviously timber frame is naturally uh, delivering the fabric first and getting that building envelope right so i think it's one of those where uh, passive house principles is not to be forgotten yeah and there's a difference between the principles and going full out for a for a passive house um, in the certification yes. well. yes yes and obviously there's a big there's a, there's a there's a cost to that but it's like everything else the passive passive house certified projects are, beca are, are becoming because they're becoming more more common now it's like everything else the cost the cost uh, barriers are, are getting uh, closer and closer all the time. So, uh, whereas when it first started, they were uh, they were they were quite high, but uh, it's now becoming more achievable. But for a lot of people, it's not it's not the certi certification they want. They want the they want the principle, and they want it because it's they want they want to do the best they can. Absolutely, that's a, that's a very good point about the cost as well as as building standards drive up, and there's another set of energy performance standards due soon, you know, the cost does come down of, of achieving those, but obviously self-builders tend to, to go above and beyond. Um, great, moving on. Um, now clearly energy saving and, and carbon saving in use are massively important, but they're not the only criteria for an eco home. Uh, and in fact, sustainability is a broader brush than just energy efficiency. Uh, some of the key aspects to consider might be embodied energy uh, and embodied carbon. So that's the the energy that goes into producing the materials, transporting them to site and things like that. Uh, the longevity and ease of maintenance of the design and the structure uh, and the materials you've used, for example, guttering, if you need to replace that after 10 years, you're, you're using extra energy to do so. Uh, and then things like healthy living, uh, internal air quality is, is a very important thing and, uh, and something that we're becoming more aware of. And then also things like soundproofing, if you can create a better quality home, uh, it will have a longer lifespan. It will appeal more to you and to future owners. Uh, so those are big factors in the wider sustainability context. Uh, Paul, a quick question for you. Do you find more clients are now taking a sort of holistic approach to their eco home projects and considering elements like embodied energy and healthy living? Um, yeah, more so as time goes on. Um, I think some of it by default, I think only the hardened eco builders would really worry too much about embodied energy specifically. But of course, by choosing modern methods of construction and more thermally efficient methods of construction, a lot of that naturally falls in line anyway. Um, so I think the overall idea of, of um, being sustainable is, is helping the planet. Um, is something that, that people are starting to consider more, um, both directly for the hardened eco warrior and more indirectly for people that just want to make a bit of a difference and want that to be a, a factor within their choice. Um, and it's great to see some genuine concern for the future coming through. Um, with the healthy living, we are seeing a lot more of the air management systems coming into to being now. Uh, people are more concerned about their internal environment and they should be. Um, Simon mentioned passive house, passive house is um, a, a high standard of thermal efficiency and air tightness and, and of course if you seal your house up you need to manage the air inside to stop it becoming stale and to keep the heat in there without losing the heat so we've seen a lot more of that coming through and um, of course sound insulation is also another part of it people don't want to hear the people in the bedroom next door and, and likewise they don't want to hear the outside noise so much so we're seeing coupled with air management systems we're seeing people eliminating uh, slot vents in windows, they're using uh, acoustic baffles in um, any sort of breaks through the external wall um, and, and a lot more consideration we're finding now to, to that internal living environment. So, and of course, building regulations are pushing carbon, locking up, locking up carbon anyway. Um, you know, SAT has got an area for um, a carbon uh, reduction. Uh, so the, the greater efficiency you build your house to, the more eco-friendly you make it, um, the greater it locks up carbon, which is which is better for the planet. So, great, thanks, Paul. And SAP being standard assessment procedure. Yeah, I course. should have said that. <laughs> yeah. um, so quickly looking now at why you might consider timber frame for your eco build. So these systems have a timber frame sips and and encapsulation panels and things like that. Timber systems in general, they have much to offer 
self builders who are looking to achieve a sustainable home. A lot of these benefits are uh, underpinned by the fact that these systems are usually factory manufactured. So you get uh, precision engineering, which helps to guarantee insulation performance. Um, you generally get thin wall profiles, which means you're getting good insulation in a, in a thinner wall. So you can potentially maximize your floor space. Um, I think design flexibility and value engineering are interesting parts of what you get with timber systems. And Paul, where would you see the sweet spot in terms of when people should bring their structural systems fire on board and, and how you can then help them maximize energy saving? Realistically, um, sooner the better. Um, once planning's been gained, uh, architects generally draw up planning drawings with a, uh, a zone for the external wall. And then once planning's been gained, they move on towards doing building regulations work um, and construction drawings, and they start to thicken the wall out and add detail to it. So at that point, you really need your frame fabricator on board because what you don't want is the architect to go away producing a set of, of construction drawings and building regulations and information drawings on an assumption and then find that when you've chosen your fabricator that he's got the wall thickness wrong or the detailing's different uh, you know things that, that the architect would need to consider and, and the, the fabricator would bring to the table are things like the wall thicknesses on the external wall and the internal wall the structural load down and the load paths uh, and the, the loads that, that are generated um, the specific detailing of the system and how um, elements interact, how the windows fit in the wall and things like this all makes a difference. Um, the specific performance characteristics, you know, what is the U value of the wall? Uh, do you need anything else to improve the U values? Um, and of course, things like services integration, you know, with the, the advent of MVHR, uh, mechanical extract systems, um, and a lot more sort of service elements coming in, integration of those services plays a bigger part as well. So, so to answer in a, in a short answer, the sooner the better, immediately after planning and before you start your building rigs work. Perfect, and obviously some companies do get involved in architectural design as well, don't they? Yes. So you can potentially pair those, those up. Um, one of the things you get with timber systems is, is a, a popular route is to shell build, uh, where you work with a company to, to produce the structural design and erect the shell for that for you on site, which can simplify site management. Simon, would you just sort of explain the basics of, of how you work that kind of route and why it's beneficial for people looking to create a sustainable home? Well, obviously, as Paul, as Paul was saying, the, the, the big thing is obviously from a timber frame perspective and a structural timber system is obviously you're, you're bringing the whole build system together. So it's a case of actually getting involved and actually working on the design but also bringing in the external walls the floors the first floors the internal walls and the roof so you've actually got one complete system because again repeating some of what Paul was saying gone are the days of building a house and thinking about it as you go along you need to pre-plan it as i always say to people the later you make the decisions the more your cost goes up the way the, the best way of bringing your cost down is not using cheaper components and cutting corners is planning it earlier and planning it better um and as paul said like there's a lot there's a lot of technology going in these houses now there's a majority of the houses that are in mechanical ventilation in them so we need to be working we need to be working that front end and by using the timber system and getting the timber frame guys on board early you could actually encapsulate that um so that it's because at the end of the day we, we if we're putting steel beams in we're putting structural beams in we need to we need to think about that and br and bring that bring that whole thing, bring that whole thing together. Because from a sustainability point of view, again, of all the different insulations we're using and all the different criteria people are wanting, because majority of self-builders these days want to build something sort of short-term pain for long-term gain. So they want, they're not interested in building rates to a certain extent as the minimum, because that's the minimum standard, not the maximum standard. And when you think on average, your self-builder these days is building down, like building regs at 0.19 U value and your average self-builder now is working at between 0.11 and 0.12. And if you'd have said that two or three years ago, you'd have never, you'd have, you'd, again, you'd have never thought it would have happened. But they're they, they're wanting to take that pain short term because they know it's actually it's actually the best value they'll ever spend. Yeah, and we should explain U values because uh, you both mentioned it now. U values are sort of a measure of 
thermal performance based on um, how much heat you lose out of the structural fabric. Um, so you want that number to be as low as possible, basically. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it helps you. The other thing people have need to think about is obviously in the current climate of the last couple of weeks we've had, the U, the this the U values help you summer and winter because at the end of the day it helps keep the heat in and keep a certain amount of the heat out because at the end of the day some of the problem we've got with overheating at the moment in these conditions is poor thermal is poor poor wall performances and so the actual insulation isn't keeping that element out either so um, it does it does work in reverse as well. Great, uh, thanks for that. Um... Another advantage of, of uh, timber systems, you've got the, the off-site manufacture, so they, they can reduce wastage. So uh, you're, again, you're, you're looking at a sustainable angle there. And, and the timber, uh, certainly in the UK, is responsibly sourced. And you can look for things like FSC chain of custody there to sort of guarantee where it's come from. Um, Paul, as well as that kind of element of sustainability of timber, I think some people have reservations about things like formaldehyde content in sheet materials or the sustainability of some plastic based insulations. How, how do you address those kind of things as a, as a timber system supplier? Um, well, timber generally, um, there's, there's no question, no issue. You know, it is the most sustainable building material in the world. Um, it, it literally does grow on trees. Um, so most companies use sustainably sourced timber. You've mentioned um, China Castle, you mentioned sustainable sourcing. Um, that's where timber's sourced from somewhere that effectively plants trees for every tree they fell and the timber is tracked all the way to its, its end use. So you can determine that it has come from a sustainable source. So that's China Custody compliancy. And I think most companies are buying into that very well now. Um, with things like the formaldehydes, um, there's, there's lots of chemicals about. Formaldehyde is, is one. It's used generally to try and help adhere some of the timbers together in some of the sheet materials. Um, and I think it's got a bad rep, really, but it is a naturally occurring substance. It, it's made of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and, and we as humans produce about one and a half ounces of formaldehyde a day. Um, but it's a normal part of our metabolism. So it does break down quickly, it doesn't accumulate, um, and it can be found in, in some paints, furniture, fish, apples, carrots, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, and in your cup of coffee. Um, so um, it's, it's, I think it's got a bad reputation and, and not necessarily for the right reasons, but um, I think as time moves on, then I think because it's got a bit of a black mark against it, I think it'll eventually be phased out, very much like sort of fossil fuels for cars. You know, it's acceptable at the minute, but you know, there are better alternatives coming through uh, and being pushed through legislation and, and through just general requirements for environmentally um, sustainable products. Um, some of the plastic insulation products, I mean, some of the plastic formulas at the moment produce some of the best rigid insulations. Um, and at the moment, the emphasis is on trying to get the best insulation you can for your external envelope. So I think in the short term, the benefits of the extra thermal performance some of these products bring to, to bear um, is over the, the course of their lifetime, outweighs some of the, the sort of short term current sustainability issues. But I think that, you know, with ever increasing efforts into improving formulas, and the, the recycling agenda getting better and stronger all the time, eventually these elements will cease to become a, a topic of any concern. So uh, we, we really have got no, no great issues with these. Yeah, that's a good point that, you know, recycling of, of insulation products and things is, is improving quite yeah. quickly, isn't it? Yeah. Um, great, and just one thing for Simon, um, I think there's a lot of debate at the moment about the performance gap between sort of the designed performance of a house and what's actually delivered in reality. So what can self-builders do to gain confidence that they'll get the sort of sustainable, efficient house they actually want? Well, obviously by having, um, working with Timber Frame and Timber Systems and an STA Assure member, you're, you're actually having a factory controlled built product. So at the end of the day, it's a guaranteed performance and got again, 
got that when you think back on the days from when you turn and have an open panel timber frame delivered to site and then you'd be putting different insulations in yourself on site 99.9 percent .9 of self-builders now want those want that timber frame pre-insulated they want they want the timber frame manufacturer to do as much as they possibly can to take the build off the critical path with the insulations with the air tightness um to make sure it's actually it is actually delivered because now with the levels we're achieving at 0 0.11 0 0.12 you can't be doing it on site and it's too labor expensive too labor intensive and you and it's not as efficient from a waste than everything else great thanks for that simon um we'll look now at some examples of timber walling systems and and get our experts to explain exactly how they're working and, and how they can benefit you um and after that we're going to have our q a session so please do i can see some questions coming through keep keep pushing them through using the q a button at the bottom of your zoom window so simon you're up first so you've kind of started already but give us the lowdown on the eco benefits of closed panel timber frame well obviously uh, closed panel timber frames are the most common with pre-insulated studs it and the beauty with timber frame is we can insulate it with anything possible so whether you want to use um uh, polyurethane whether you want to use sort of natural insulations that that is the beauty we can insulate it in whatever driver that um, that you're thinking and as we said earlier whether it's you're wanting the thinnest wall possible some people want to turn around and keep the walls really really thin so you've then got to have a very very high performing uh, insulation or you want to turn around and go to a natural insulation which enables you to turn around and go to a thicker thicker wall you value you can see that um, with the system we've got there, uh, we're delivering new values down to sort of 0 0.08, 0 0.09, depending on that panel thickness with the uh, insulation liner on the inside face of the panel um, and the air tightness wrapping around the panel and around the floor zone and back up and then taping that onto the insulation liner. Um, and that insulation liner can be anything from uh, 20 mil on the inside of the panel up to uh, sort of 100, 120 mil, depending on what um, depending on what you values you're trying to uh, trying to achieve. And there are a lot of there are a lot of systems out there. So as Paul was saying earlier, it pays to get on board early with the tim with the, with the chosen timber frame supplier because a lot mo a lot of timber frames are different because of the way they detail it, which ends up then with your wall thicknesses being different. So again, as Paul said, whereas majority of timber frame people now are doing for self build are doing sort of the management with building regs drawings and helping with saps and things like that because it the it is it's a lot more critical and people are wanting to maximize that internal space as well so and then roof and floor systems are always part of the um part of the timber frame system um to give you that complete build uh, like that so and then obviously you can see with tech vantage the tech vantage yes we said about natural systems that is our natural sustainable system so we can use that with glass wool we can use that with um warm cell um i see a question coming in earlier with hemp um any kind of natural insulation possible the only thing you've got to think about is what the key drivers are if you're wanting to have something recycled then obviously glass wool rock wool is fairly well recycled product if you're what if you're if your driver is breathability again they're breathable walls because what you do have to think about is obviously as you go down the natural insulation the walls will get thicker to achieve that chosen new value and you just have to sort of weigh the one weigh the one again the other as to what you really what you really want to um what your key drivers are and then obviously on the outside of the timber frames as you can see there we're showing brickwork up the outside um people say what can i clad my timber frame in when you think now that one in four less than one in five timber frames are actually clad in masonry construction now um it's unbelievable how um self builders self builders have gone down the dry construction route with offsite so we can clad it in absolutely anything um from sort of uh render board to tile hanging to sort of uh, claddings um 
anything anything uh, anything you like so but again that needs to be looked at fairly early doors because that does depend that does make a difference to our u values through the walls um and like some people say to me oh well i was going to have brickwork round i've now decided that i'm not going to use brickwork i want to go to lightweight cladding you can't just change like that because again it, it affects your u values and it also affects the wind loads and the racking of the timber frame as well so and again changing changing your mind will cost you money then obviously the other the other system you'll see there now tech vantage t we talked my one of the first questions was about passive house um going down the passive house route you can use tech vantage e with the polyurethane but obviously one of the big drivers is reducing thermal bridging and re re reducing the coal bridging through the studs so using tech vantage e is a very unique ultimate system now that's getting used very mainstream now um so you're actually got two 90 mil panels with a separated stud in there. Some people can use eye joists, some people will use metal web joists in a vertical situation. But both of those systems, you've still got continuity from the outside skin to the inside skin. With Tech Vantage, it is a separated stud. So you're taking your thermal, you're taking your timber fraction, and your timber fraction is the percentage of timber per square meter in the panel. And on the previous two systems, you're looking at about 14 to 15 percent with tech t you're looking at about six and a half percent so obviously by reducing that timber content and then going over to uh putting more insulation in there you are reducing that down but also because it's a twin frame system the inside skin is load bearing the outside skin is not so again the outside skin is purely a cladding skin so that you're actually um increasing the uh increasing the insulation and reducing the timber content in the region even more um, like that so um, you can see and the with tech vantage t we're achieved with a 300 oh, just over 300 mil wall you're you're on our you like it starts at a 0.13 u value and if we want to get down to less than 0.1 or around 0.1 we can do that as a as a 400 mil wall with no polyurethane on the inside if you want to go ultra natural and sustainable or we could get the wall th pull the wall thickness back to 270 and add the polyurethane liner on the inside side and ironically the case study we're going to talk about um used the tech vantage t um and this was a project we built out in uh, west suffolk for a client um it's amazing how timber frame travels people say is it in your area and uh, it was completely the other side of the country but the client with this project her main driver was to have a sustainable home a breathable home but she wanted something with ultimate reduced uh, thermal bridging and obviously tech vantage t uh, worked very well for that so you can see how the timber frame went up um, a very unique design and it's covered it'll, uh, we'll have a full-blown case study on this and all the photography in the next couple of months and it just looks absolutely awesome from what you can't like obviously on the top left you can see the timber frame going up and again one of the unique parts of this project was the client wanted to erect it themselves um which is very unusual these days um nine out of ten timber frame projects we do are supplied and erected um so that they're zero rated but you can see the client the client and her brother on the roof she was so hands-on susanna was through this build every step of the way um she wanted to put her mark on it and actually run the build herself and obviously um john her brother was an engineer so that made a big difference they came to the factory we walked them through the system i talked them through all the build sequence and how to put it all together and i must admit the times i heard off john on site i could count on two hands very nearly it was it was unbelievable how well he went through that and uh, uh worked worked really worked really really well and obviously you can see the cedar shingles there um on the roof there were and i can't remember there were thousands and thousands of cedar shingles on there but it was amazing how it enabled the roof to run into the walls and actually lose the building in the in the countryside and uh, no so it just goes to show it can be done and as i said tech vantage t is becoming very very mainstream so watch out for that case study shortly fantastic amazing superb house Simon and 
it's yeah, glorious. Yeah. yeah, very, very unique design, there must have been. Yeah, it pulls back to it to what we were saying earlier, you know, beauty in architecture and things like that. That that can help with the sustainability side of it as well. Um, and that that was again from Susanna's what we, we were involved doing that very early doors with it because she she spoke to a few different companies and, and they were sort of almost hands off with it. Whereas for us, we completely embraced it, took the project on. And again, as Paul was saying earlier, projects like that, you can't just go out to the market and make your decision very late in the process. You've got to, you've got to bring the timber frame company in as part of the family to work up all those details. Great. Okay, thanks, Simon. Uh, we'll move on quickly to have a, a, a very quick look at oak frame. Uh, and modern oak frame structures are, are usually encapsulated with insulating panels to give you the warmth and character of oak internally, but modern standards of performance. And um, this is, is often done with SIPs actually, um, although some oak frame specialists offer their own proprietary systems. And we're showing here um, Oakwright's right wall natural system, which can achieve U values down to 0.15 for walls, uh, slightly lower for roofs, um, and is actually capable of supporting passive house standards for insulation and air tightness. Um, and sustainability wise, something like this particular system uses natural uh, recycled cellulose insulation, which is basically old newspapers. Uh, and so it's a low carbon product and the panel design supports breathability, which helps to manage things like moisture levels and deliver a healthier internal climate. So systems like this can be quite holistic as well. Um, and uh, you'll see in this picture here, they're also becoming more highly prefabricated. So uh, things like the cladding can be prefixed and windows even prefitted and things like that in some circumstances. And those kind of uh, extra bits of factory manufacture can help guarantee the quality and guarantee uh, the performance that you're looking for. Um, moving on now, we'll get to SIPs. Um, so Paul, can you take us through how the SIP system works and why it's a strong fit for eco projects. I'll give you a whistle stop tour. So yeah. <laughs> um, right, what have you got? Impressive U values. So I mean, pretty much, you know, similar to Simon's in a way. Um, most people accept that um, a U value about 0 0.18, 0 0.19 is sort of current building regs standards um it's a deemed to satisfy so it's it's almost a if you achieve that you, you're gonna pass the backdrop's 0.3 which is quite poor but um like you said earlier the lower the better so really you, you should be aiming at anything below about 0.21 um on u value simon was talking about figures of, of sort of 0.13 and around there um the, the tech system itself um is manufactured, I'll come to the U-values in a minute, but it's manufactured in two sizes, two thicknesses. It's 142 mil and 172 mil thick. Um, it's um, it's made in, in sort of 12, 20 wide sections up to about seven and a half meters long. What we tend to do is we take the 12, 20 wide sections and we sub-assembly them so that you make them into larger format panels. And then we'll be craning on site with the erect then um, we, we speed up the erection process. There's not lots of little small panels. There's less larger panels because of the sub-assembly. Um, the U-values, uh, the 142 tech panel will give us a U-value of 0.18 with a brickwork clad. Uh, the 172 will give us a U-value of 0.16 quite easily with uh, brickwork cladding. Uh, Simon mentioned lightweight claddings becoming more prominent, and yes, they are and you'd lose about 0.02 on the U value with lightweight cladding just because there's less resistance to thermal loss. Um, so the 142 will give us 0.2, 172 will give us 0.18 with lightweight claddings. Uh, that said, um, and, and passive else has been mentioned before, uh, we have got solutions for passive. And if we take a 142 panel and we put on a, a 90 mil insulation on the outside and envelope that, that structure completely, then we can take the U values down as low as 0 0.09, which is getting to sort of the, the really, really exemplary performance levels. Um, the SIP system is lightweight. Uh, the, the 142 panel is about 24 kilograms a meter squared. So it's quite useful for areas where people have got maybe poor ground conditions um, and need engineered foundations because if you put in a, a lightweight system, you need less of a foundation to support it. And, and less foundation is less cost. And 
I, what I haven't said is what a structurally insulated panel, what a SIPS is, and it's actually a structural insulated panel. It's an alternative to timber frame. And what the, um, the makeup is, is effectively two timber sheets. Uh, you can see on the diagram there, two timber sheets, um, and they are separated by a insulation core. So what it does is um, that the SIP system removes any of the vertical studs in a similar way to Simon was looking at with his Vantage system, where it got the stud panel on the inside, the stud panel on the outside, but a break in the middle. So what we've done is sort of, we've, we've taken that stud away completely. So we've only got the break. So there's no break in the insulation value from the outside of the panel to the inside of the panel. So, um, Thermal bridging. Simon had mentioned quite a bit about thermal bridging. Thermal bridging is becoming a very important part now of, uh, of building um, and building control put quite a big emphasis on thermal bridging. Um, I think it's been a bit of a sort of a forgotten area, but um, building control work on a 15% thermal bridge. So they, they assume that 15% of your insulated wall system is going to be broken with something going from the outside to the inside. So a stud or something similar, a rail or a plate. Um, now, with Simon's system, I would imagine his thermal bridging values are now down very, very low. And the same with our tech system, our SIP system, we can get thermal bridging down at, at two, three percent very easily. Um, and in some cases, less than one. If you go to passive, it's it's almost negligible. It's less than one percent. So a, a very, very marked improvement on building control. And um, the way we join the panels is, if you go back to the previous picture, is we have a mini version of the SIPS panel and it slots in. We route the foam out either side, the insulation out either side, and we, we set in a smaller version of it. So that we're not adding in any sort of timber element that, that runs from outside to inside. So we maintain that thermal insulation layer um, and, and we, we just we, we keep a good, um, a good thermal bridging value there. Um, let's have a think, what else can I? Uh, air tightness then, we'll go on to air tightness. Um, because we, we're sealing everything up, um, the system itself, the panel itself is, is airtight down to about level one. Building regulations say level 10 is their backdrop. So you've got to be better than that. Most systems, I suppose, are round about the sort of the levels of five to seven. So with a level of one on the panel itself, we're, we're again, we're, we're far better than building regs. And we maintain that by, as that spline, that joint goes in, any joint that is foam to foam, we foam together to seal it. Where we've got an end of a panel and two panels join on a corner or where we've got a, a, a window or a door inserted, we, we route out the edge of the foam, leaving the timbers and we, we insert a timber in there to provide a fixing point around a window and an end of a panel. Where we do that, we silicone the joint. So we maintain the air tightness that way. So um, we, work, we work very closely with, um, with the architects as well to look at the detailing to make sure that uh, we maintain that, that air tightness. Um, and then of course, there's the, um, the panels to the base, there's the panels to the window. So not only can we silicone those areas, but um, a, a, as a double, check really as a belt and braces um we um we can seal that as well or on site you can seal those areas with a good quality sealing tape so um just a quick bit about the super strong um the insulation that goes in is a um a, a, a urethane insulation it's injected wet between the the sheet in timbers and then it expands and it dries and it cures and it's very, very strong. And the strength is derived from the bond between the three elements. It's certified, BBA certified up to four stories. Um, and you can pretty much fix any of the external cladding materials directly to it pretty much anywhere. Um, so moving on to the um, case study. Um, 
we've got a case study here. Um, it was the, the Jays, David Jay. Uh, it was a tech unit. It was um, manufactured with 142 uh, mil tech walls, 172 mil tech roof. And they uh, were very, very keen to get as good an eco house as they could. And they had a, a SAP target of 92. Uh, I think from memory, everything over, I'm not sure it's 89 or 91, is an A rating. Um, and they wanted 92. So they wanted to go straight into that A rated um, end use house. Um, what they did is they um, they looked at uh, photovoltaic uh, cells on the roof that you can't see in, in the picture. They used uh, an air source heat pump. So they were very keen on renewable energy and, and wanted to really reduce their impact on the grid as much as they could. They, um, the, the frame was erected in about two weeks. There was a mezzanine floor in there. There was vaulted ceiling. So, in, in terms of architecturally, it's, it's similar in a way to the, the example that Simon had given. Um, but in this instance, their aim was, was a, a target of 92 in SAP. They actually achieved 97, and it's 97 out of 100. If you get to 100, you are effectively energy neutral. So 97 is almost energy neutral. And I think if you went over 100, then you become a net exporter of energy you you end up being a, a producer of electricity because you're producing more than you're using um, with the air source heat pump the there is a still currently a renewable heat incentive and the government will pay you an amount of money per year for a number of years for using certain technologies and the amount the government will pay in is actually in this instance worked out more than their current electricity bill so that's how good it was um, and just to give you some stats on it, the external wall U value, so the thermal performance was 0.12, so a very good U value. The roof was the same, that was 0.12. The air tightness was down at 1.3, so bearing in mind building makes is 10, we got right down to 1.3 across all the construction. The floor was 0.09, so extremely high floor U value. And importantly, going right back to um, you know carbon, uh, locking in carbon, there was an 87% improvement over building rates requirements on the carbon emission rate and a 25% improvement on building regulations, energy efficiency standards. So quite, um, quite a, a nice little unit actually, all wrapped up, eco-friendly, high performing and virtually cost neutral in terms of, of energy input. So fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Paul. And I, th I think this project actually won best SIPs home in our in our Build It Awards 2020. So yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> a coincidence now. <laughs> um, great. Um, so some really interesting stuff there, and uh, we're now going to take uh, as many as your question of your questions as we can, um, and. There are quite a lot, but we are going to do our best to get through as many of them as possible. So, uh, Simon and Paul, if I could invite you to um, switch your cameras back on. Uh, and our first question is from Dawn, um, got in there early. Is MVHR the only option when building towards passive house standard? Um, she's not keen on the ducting. Um, anyone want to take that one? Um, it's... I mean, passive house is a combination of lots of things. It's a combination of all the fabric elements, so a good air tightness, a good thermal U value, uh, good thermal bridging values. Um, but it goes beyond that, and it goes into things like solar shading to prevent overheating, an orientation. Um, there's a lot more to it. And MVHR and management is purely one part of that. But it would be an essential part because with an air tightness requirement for passive of 0.6, 0 0.6, bear in mind building range is 10, anything really better than about an air tightness of three would take you into stuffy internal environment territory. So 
anything better than three, you would need some form of air management system anyway. So I hope that answers your question, John. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you're worried about the ducting, obviously things like metal web joists and things, you can hide the ducting away in, in there and yeah. it doesn't actually change what your internal environment feels like. There's just a few vents here and there, but, but nothing yeah. spectacular. It comes back to what we said earlier. Um, Simon said it, I'd said it about um, getting your fabricator in early to run through that design coordination process and and look at how to integrate all those elements. You know, it's not just MVHR, it's gonna be, I don't know, CAT6 cables, you know, there's all sorts now going into smart systems and, and they've all got to be rooted around the house somehow. So involving the architect, involving the um, frame fabricator early and you can integrate these elements and hide them away. Right. Um, Simon, you get to take the next one then. Uh, so Kate has asked, how expensive is timber build versus brick and block? Uh, she's looking to build around the 200 to 220 meters squared home. Um, and does the speed of a timber frame sort of outweigh the labor costs uh, needed for brick and block? I think you've got to, the cost angles come been around for years. And I think you've got to look, it depends on one, what sort of thermal performance you're wanting to build, um, because obviously, if you're looking to build something based on building regs, um, then brick and block and timber frame material cost is fairly similar. But obviously, your lay like whereas whereas timber frame is slightly more expensive on materials, but using far 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 less labour and is more is more efficient. Whereas the traditional build is the other way around, and obviously very very expensive on on the labour element. But if you're looking to build down around sort of 0 0.15 0 0.14. The lower you start bringing that U value down, timber systems, whether it be SIPs or timber frame, come in to play very, very much then because as, as those U values are getting lower, other sort of masonry construction is really, really struggling. And obviously then your wall system, your wall thickness is getting a lot, lot thicker. Um, going back to the cost per square meter, you can't these days because, again, as some of the questions have come in, and I thought we'd get them on, on rising material costs. You can't at the moment. You ha it's based on design because at the end of the day, as one of my favourite things is, if it can be drawn, it can be built. And at the end of the day, depending on very how open plan it is, how traditional looking it is, and layouts that affects the cost. And again, it depends on the specifications we're trying to integrate in there. As Paul was saying, with sort of metal web joists for mechanical ventilation and things like that so i would say get the drawings in let's have a look at it and uh, um but at the moment it's still the most cost effective best energy efficient system to be using great um david has asked us um does using brick cladding for instance reduce the u value of the frame does it reduce the u values or the um, performance in general i suppose it, it helps with the U-values over a lot of the lightweight claddings. Um, normally, it's partly due to the fact that the cavity is a, um, um, it's a, a, an open to atmosphere cavity. Um, but then you've got the, the four inch of brickwork cladding or stone or masonry, you know, block work with render on, whatever it is. Um, but any masonry cladding will give you the best U-value because it's really a bit of extra thickness that helps. Um, but only by normally, only by about 0.02. So like I said, if you've got a system that works at um, 0.18 for brickwork, then it would be a 0.2 generally for lightweight cladding. So it does give you a little bit of an advantage, but of course you can, you can cater for that by putting in a slightly thicker insulation or up in the spec of the insulation into the wall system um, keep the same wall thickness, but just improve its thermal efficiency um, at, at no detriment to, to uh, lightweight cladding. Perfect. Um, I've got a question from Diane. How long do timber homes tend to last? Um, I think that has a big impact on the overall sustainability of a, of a project, obviously. Um, Simon, do you want to grab that one? I'm going to say, it's again, another popular question. Um, timber frame is now, timber systems are deemed a mainstream form of construction now, which have to be, which have to last a minimum of 60 years anyway. And all build systems are only, 
uh, tested up to that up to 60 years. So um, the gone are the days where uh, timber frame was sort of deemed a very sort of short term lifespan um, like that. And like some of the oldest buildings in the country are, are timber built. So um, like that. So no, it's got good longevity. Excellent. Um, quick question on uh, from an anonymous anonymous attendee, but um, Paul, this is for you. How do you hang TVs, pictures, cabinets, etc., on SIPs walls if there are no noggins? We supply skyhooks with the. Um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> no, it's um, with, with the SIPs. It's very easy because the SIPs has got a, a, a solid fifteen mil OSB. Um, liner on the inside so you can screw through your plasterboard straight into that not a problem um, if we're using if you're putting a lot of services in there and, and we then lift the plasterboard away from the surface of the the, the tech panel itself by the, the distance of a, a service zone baton for instance then you can then put some some noggins behind localized as to where you want to hang anything particularly heavy um, and it really is only for things that are particularly heavy. Things like plasma TVs are becoming vogue at the minute, um, you know, hung on the wall. So you know where the fixing points are going to be roughly for them. You can put in an area of, of um, recessed timber to support that. Or you could actually, what they do in bathrooms very often, is line the whole wall with ply. So you've got fixing points anywhere and everywhere. Um, it does want a little bit of thinking forward sometimes, but it's not the end of the world. And it really is only relevant for, for extra heavy things. Yeah, fantastic. And they do that in plant rooms as well, don't they? A lot, putting up extra ply for, for all the gubbins. Um, David has asked, he's thinking of asking his timber frame company to do all of the building regs. Would we recommend this approach? I think that yes. Was yes. <laughs> It's as Paul, as Paul was saying earlier, and ironically, we're on a build in the Midlands at the moment, and it's one of those where you've it's it's so key these days with sort of uh, very very contemporary design where we've got different liners on the inside of the panel different thicknesses service battens and then trying to line internal walls up with external walls and load burning walls it's it's really these days i think a lot of self builders are going down the route keep get the get the plan in and once they've got plan in then get your timber frame on board and get your timber frame company on board helping you with the building regs and take and with that critical design to help you help you through the buildability of this as well to get the best out of the building because again some people are very traditional with it with their architecture and the sort of uh, understanding the systems because at the end of the day as as uh, Paul's been saying it's an engineered system so at the end of the day, you can't just you can't just design it based on the last job you did. Every project's different. They're like that. So yes, I would say it is. And I and to be honest, uh, as a business, we're finding most probably it's the major the majority of the clients and self builders these days want the building regs. They want that design taken off the critical path and wrapped up with the specialist. We, we tend to find a bit of both, really. Um, you know, we, we've got the two sides to the company, the Potton brand and the Kingspan Timber Solutions brand. And pretty much as Simon says, you know, the Potton brand runs with an architectural service and that can undertake the building regs for people. Um, the Kingspan Timber Solutions brand is more of a the old sort of commercial style brand where we'll take people's drawings with an architect already in tow and we'll work extensively with that architect on the details of the system. So we cover both, um, but either way, it's that, that integration and that attention to detail um, that's key. Um, fantastic. I'm not gonna ask, answer the one about finding a good eco home architect because I think we'll be here all day. Um, but uh, we've got a question about whether deficiency in air tightness is something that comes to light during snagging. I mean, I think ideally you wanna be checking for that kind of stuff much earlier in your program but Simon would you would you agree with me on that yeah look again that's something um people from like air tightness air tightness is all about uh workmanship and simple detailing like for for a long time now people think that complicated detailing makes better better performance and it doesn't because the more complicated the detail the harder it is to achieve it's just keeping it simple but yeah going back to you said at the end of the day i always say to people 
air tightness checking really is quite is is well worth doing twice post plaster post plasterboard and then and then after because once you plasterboard in it um you can t like it's one of those if you can get it done pre plasterboard and then post plasterboard then that makes a big uh, big difference there like that but again with the detailing of the way the way timber systems work they're naturally airtight anyway so your membranes your 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 insulations and things like that it's far easier to achieve those um air tightness details and that not needing pallet balls of uh, mask mastic uh, tubes yep very good um a specific one um yeah let's ask this one how, how do you fit some martin how do you fix something like a breeze soleil to a timber frame house without causing structural problems? Anyone fancy that one? Well, it has to be designed in the first. It has, like again, you can't just you can't just fit it to anything, whether it's timber frame, masonry, anything. It's got to be designed, and it needs to be designed in the first place. And that's what you like. It doesn't matter what form of construction, you can't just stick it on the wall. So as long as it's designed in in the first place, it can be achieved. Great. Um, specific question on SIPs. Um, it's actually for a garden studio. So it's a glue lamb frame with um, glazing and SIPs for the walls. Uh, and Mike would like to know, can the SIPs be externally clad with stone slips directly or do they need a support frame? They would need, in essence, some form of support frame. Um, and it doesn't have to be a convoluted frame, but you can't fix directly to the panel itself you would need a cavity between the panel and the back of the slips. So what you do is you, you'd batten off with a, a 50 mil batten, and then you'd put some form of board on, and then you'd attach your slips to that. Great. Easy as that. Okay. Um, what have we got here? What thickness of wall would you need to get down to U values of 0.1, 0.09? Uh, in both of your systems? Again, it depends on, the, uh, to a certain extent, again, you can't, it's like square meter rates. That, that depends on what insulation you want to use, what drivers, whether you want to use natural insulations or PAR. That also depends then on whether you want to have a masonry cladding or a natural, um, a natural cladding. But like if you were using a masonry clad, uh, if you've got a masonry cladding on that, you'd be looking at a, uh, your masonry hundred, your cavity, your hundred and forty mil frame, and then about a ninety mil polyurethane, polyurethane liner with a service batten, and then plasterboard. So they're uh, um, like that. So if you add that, they're uh, um, but that that's your that that would be about your thinnest thinnest solution. Three hundred ninety-seven mil. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you were adding up as I was going along. <laughs> It's effectively, if you were using brickwork on, on a SIP system, if you wanted a U value of 0 0.09, you'd go brickwork, 100 mil, cavity, 50 mil. We put 90 mil of external insulation on, 142 mil of um, tech panel, and then say a 15 mil plasterboard internally. Um, you could add 25 mil to that if you wanted a service zone in there. That would give you 0 0.09. We've done that many, many times with um, Norwich City Council where we built 112 passive houses and that was a system we had for them, so. Great. Um, and Mike has asked, um, Simon, you mentioned different suppliers have different and, and often unique systems. Uh, on that basis, how can someone like him uh, sort of market test and make sure he's getting the best uh, technical and most cost-effective solution? I think it's uh, obviously over the last 12 months, it's been very hard doing factory visits and that. But again, it's a matter of actually sort of uh, look, meeting up with those different, those handful of suppliers and actually see, see what their offerings are, see the factory and actually see the projects they've done. Because every, to every, a lot of timber frame companies are offering something different and you need to, it isn't, it isn't just about price. It isn't just skip to the bottom of the, the, the quote and it's costing X amount of thousands. It's actually what they're putting in there. And so I think um, factory visits are a must um, to get that selection process and meet up and meet up with the people like that. And as I said, if you can get around and see some projects built with the systems as well, then all the better. 
Fantastic. Um, next up, um, Denver has asked uh, about when you have additional insulating linings on SIPs, is it best to go internal or external? Um, that's a good question. Uh, we tend to go external. And the reason for that at the moment is some years back, there used to be a lot of generic fire tests and every, every timber frame system was, um, was, was deemed to satisfy if they worked to a certain standard. Um, and that was generated by British Gypsum. Well, they've since ceased to do that and it's left the industry needing fire testing. Well, the STA have picked up on that. They've done a brilliant job and they fire tested lots of systems. The specific systems are then specifically fire tested to satisfy their own requirements. We've got fire testing on the SIPs for the 142, the 172, but we've got fire testing to use the insulation on the outside and not necessarily the insulation on the inside of the panel. So we would at this stage work to the outside. It's got the advantage also of it envelopes the, um, the external joints between potentially the walls and the roof and it runs up the outside of the joist zone. So it actually enhances the thermal bridging by doing it that way. Um, this is a, a, an interesting one from Mark, um, asking about how, how good your walls are for thermal mass and how they compare to each other on that kind of uh, side of things. Do you want to go first, Simon? Well, as we said, obviously it's, they're, they're a light system, so we're not, unless you're incorporating thermal mass into the structure additionally, um, but to be honest, thermal mass is something that people aren't really um that's sort of that's sort of passed us by to a certain extent now because we don't want something that's going to turn around and heat up and then we can't control in the evenings when we want it cooler and it's sort of like an uncontrollable radiator really um so um like at the end of the day you imagine at the moment where you've got some great thermal mass and some internal walls and then now go, go to bed and then you, it's the house is hot enough as it is without that then radiating out afterwards and it's it's one of those where uh, yeah in the last few years thermal mass isn't it's more about it's more about getting a uh, an energy efficient uh, airtight home that sort of warms up quickly um like that rather than thermal mass I, i'd agree very much so it's um thermal mass is very much like the old panel radiators you know you, you're trying to predict what the weather will be tomorrow to determine whether you want to use your um, economy seven electric to heat up your radiators tonight in, in preparation for it. And thermal mass is very much the same as Simon says. Um, both systems are lightweight systems and they react quite quickly. They, you can heat them up very quickly because they hold the heat in. And if you want to cool them down, you can cool them down very quickly by kicking in your air management system or opening the windows. So you've got controllable heat. If you want to heat it up again very quickly, well, you just shut the windows and turn your air management off for a little while and put your heating back on and it reacts very, very quickly. Fantastic. Uh, question from Neil. He's been recommended twin stud walls with 200 mil panels uh, and with a total insulation thickness of about 350 mil. Um, blown cellulose apparently is, is what has been recommended. Uh, and that's been suggested as the most economical option for him in terms of cost and time. Is that, is that the right approach? Do you feel um, it's difficult to say for sure because we don't know exactly what his project goals are? <laughs> no, he should be using SIPs. <laughs> <laughs> With Skyox. <laughs> we have had a, we have had someone say they would like a quote for the Skyhooks. <laughs> <laughs> They're only in pallet quantities. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, a twin, a, a twin, seriously, a twin stud system is very efficient and does what it says on the tin. But again, it depends on what the drivers are. And to pay, uh, the, the, the because at the end of the day, a twin stud, twin stud system is more expensive than a single stud system um, like that, because you've got far more insulation in it. So um, so it depends on what the drivers are. But I, I do see, I do see twin stud becoming more popular and more people using it now because they want to use it. Because obviously with a twin stud, you're using natural insulations and sort of breathable insulations. You're not using it with polyurethane because that's why you're you that's why you're going down the, the uh, separated stud route. So, um, but you do need a bigger footprint for it. There, 
like that because your wall system is thicker. Um, but yeah, we've just done a, a site of three houses with twin stud now. Um, the client one, the client was determined to turn and have something very, very environmentally friendly and sort of very, very good U values. Um, and when you think it's starting at like 0 0.13, 0 0.12 um, with a natural insulation um, like that. So I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see more of it. But again, it's, it depends on what, uh, what the individual person's drivers are. Great. A um, couple, of, couple of more questions, I think, and then we'll have to leave it at that. But uh, Kelly has asked what the best type of ground floor system would be for, um, in her case, a SIP build. Um, um, yeah. It really depends. I mean, we, we can build the, the superstructure, the main house, over whatever base is provided. Um, so it really depends on, again, like Simon says, it's, it's project specific details. You know, what are the ground conditions? The ground conditions favor one form of floor slab over another. Um, it, it really depends on, on specifics. I think in terms of costs, there's very little difference now between block and beam and ground bearing slabs. Um, it's probably block and beam might be a little bit easier because it's a dry construction. So there's no real sort of drying time like you've got with a, a ground bearing slab. But again, if it's passive, then it might well be that they've got to put a raw foundation in and incorporate lots of insulation, you know, to get the thermal bridging right at the, the junction between the edge of the slab and the wall. So it, it very much depends on, on what, what the design parameters are and what the ground conditions are. That's pretty much all I could say on that. Yep, no, that's, I think you can't do any better than that. And basically you can build it on anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Okay, one more question. Just one thing, Chris, I would say on that to put for Paul as well is yeah. one of the things you're see you are seeing a bit at the moment is at the end of the day, we've always said to self builders, do not drop a bucket in the ground until you've got your timber system provider on board and the engineered information because it is, as Paul said, it's a lightweight structure and budget-wise, you can make the money on the project or lose the money on the project in the ground. So don't over-engineer over those foundations based on, oh, well, we built this sort of house three months ago and we, we did this before. Wait till you get the line and point loads, wait till you get the engineering and then pass that out onto the foundation designer. And I couldn't emphasize that enough at the moment because again, we want to be smarter with it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, right, so one final question. This is from Adam. When engaging your timber frame or SIP supplier, um, who and how should you get to calculate your overall U values, and uh, particularly when adding in the following and follow-on elements like windows and doors and things like that? If it's straight U values, I think most most companies have got some form of ability to be able to address that. Um, we do. If somebody comes to us and says, "This is what I'm using." Um, I'm using, I don't know, zinc cladding and a baton and I want a U-value of, of 0.12, then we, we can do a U-value calc and work out what that's going to be. Um, it's, it's very often a difficult one to, to work because you don't know sometimes exactly what you need until you are a little bit further down the line and you've gone through that process using the SAP um, as part of the building regs and balanced all those elements up. Um, so your SAT would be key to it. Now, a lot of people use independent SAP assessors. Some frame companies can do the SAPs for people. Um, I know we do. I, I don't know what you do, Simon. Do you do the SAPs in-house as well? or? We, we, we will do the SAP. We've got an external guy doing the SAPs for us. So you have, like, as you said, it changes. So you'll get a draft set to start with yeah. and then update it once you know more because different different elements affect it. Yeah. And, and effectively then, um, you know, once you've got those balance elements, the SAP will turn around and say, yes, you comply. Yes, you comply, but you are 10% better than building regulations asked ask for. Or it might be, you know, if you've got, I don't know, some, some really poor windows being used, you might fail, but then you can play about with the elements and see what you need to do to balance that failure up to get to a pass. And the SAP's done twice. It's done a design stage. So it's what I think I'm going to use. And building control will ask for an as-built stage one, which is what you actually did use, because building control are aware that 
sometimes what's in the specification isn't always what's used on site. Yeah, fantastic. And I, yeah, I'll echo what you said there because I remember on the when we were doing the Builder Education House, you know, we worked with actually with the architect in that case mainly to to sort of narrow down our SAP. We had a target in mind, and we just played with the elements until we got there. Basically, talking to our different suppliers and things like that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, so. I'm afraid that is all we've got time for, but thank you so much to our two STA experts, Simon Orles from Frame Technologies and Paul Duffin from Potman and Kingspan Timber Solutions. There are some brilliant questions in there. Um, so thank you as well to you. We've obviously not been able to get around to every single one. So if you do have a specific question you'd like to ask, please do email build it on build it at castlemedia.co.uk and we'll be, we'll be able to put you in touch with either Simon or Paul um, or one of our other many experts that we work with uh, to get you the right answer. There were some questions not particularly related to, to timber systems. Um, but yes, a huge thank you once again to our panelists and to our sponsor, the Structural Timber, Timber Association for helping to make this very informative webinar happen. You can find out more about the STA and search for your ideal project partner at www.structuraltimber.co.uk uh, and Build It runs a series of informative webinars and virtual self-build training courses so do log on to our website, self buildcouk to discover how we can help you move your project forward. I hope you've enjoyed this session and thank you all for watching. Thank you all. Thank you.